Thanks everyone for joining us. Um, we have um, a short presentation today. Um, we'll also, we're, um, we're recording this, so we'll also post it on the website so that you're able to see and refer it and share also with your colleagues and then the organization. Um, so today we're really gonna talk about how to propose a capstone project. Um, so I'm Jennifer Mangold. I'm the Chief Innovation and Learning Officer here at the Fung Institute. I'm also joined by my colleagues, uh, Kelly Klein and Julie McShane, who um, will be helping out with the um, questions that you leave in the chat. So please, as those come up, drop them over there. Um, and Julie will also talk about um, other ways that companies and partners can um, interact with us at the Fung Institute and recruit some of our students. We also have um, two really great partners that have hosted Capstone projects and also recruited some of our students. So they're, they're great examples of um, this collaboration and we'll hear from them. So Douglas Hutchings from Squishy Robotics and then also Tiffany Tao from Blue Goji. So the first thing I wanna talk about a little bit about the IMAGE program in general. So it's a one year experiential learning um, program, professional development. Our students are learning um, technical skills while also leadership skills, which I'll get into a little bit about how we do that in the next slide. Um, this slide gives a great overview of our cohort from this year. So we have lots of students, um, you know, upwards of 400 that come from all over the US as well as globally. Um, we also are right at the heart of the College of Engineering. So we have students um, represented from all of our seven different disciplines, which is one of the really value adds of our program for the students and for also companies that work with us because you're able to work with students, um, not in just one of the, our majors or um, engineering disciplines, but really look at these projects from an interdisciplinary standpoint. So um, at the heart of the MN program, so it's a one-year professional master's of engineering program here at UC Berkeley, housed in the Fung Institute. Um, at the heart of this is the capstone program, um, which is where our students are learning to work on real-world pro problems, technical challenges with either faculty or industry partners, um, which I'll talk a little bit more about, while they're also getting their technical coursework um, for the degree and learning engineering leadership, which includes project management, um, teaming, communication, all along the way. So it's a pretty packed program um, and there's lots of touch points. Um, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we integrate partners into the program and the value to you as an organization and also the value to our students. Um, also, as I talk about the one year program, it is academic year, which is important when you're thinking about scoping a project. So it is a nine month um, fall semester and spring semester. So I'll get into that when we go into the timeline as well. Okay, working with Zoom today. Um, okay, so um, as, you, as you dive into looking at um, the program, as I said, so capstone is kind of a cornerstone. And this is where our students are working in teams ranging from three to five students that are really working on developing a technical solution to either industry, research, or social problem. And we do that by partnering with our faculty here on campus. Um, so they also pitch projects to our students and also our industry partners and outside organizations will pitch projects to the students. Um, it's a couple of a unique value add that we also offer within the image program because at the same time they're making their um, technical requirements within their degree program. So depending what department they're in or what concentration they're focused on. So they are working um, on completing their degree in that format as they're doing the capstone project. And a lot of times those technical courses are helping align with their capstone. So if it's a, a student that's interested in learning about a specific concentration or for example, machine learning or AI, they could be taking courses in that and also working on a capstone that's aligned with that as well. The other piece, which is the top gear on this curriculum is um, leadership training. So they take um, you at a boot camp, leadership boot camp in 
fall semester as well as the beginning of spring semester. So it's sort of a mini MBA um, where they're learning um, a lot of project management, as I mentioned, teaming, communications, uh, R&D strategy from industry, um, our industry instructors. And so that really kind of bolsters and sets them up to not only obviously learn their engineering, but also becoming engineering leaders, um, which is a value add to the students. And then also I'll tell you how um, you can leverage that when you're thinking about your capstone proposal as well. And so, as you can see, it could be a, a packed year, um, but this integration is, is what we've seen is really valuable, um, driving our, our students to set them up for success, again, to be uh, professional engineers, but really bring into that leadership um, in whatever organizations they end up in. So this is a very exciting part of the year um, as we're starting to look for new capstone partners. So we wanted to host this webinar to really um, share with you some of the best ways to craft a proposal and what that looks like so it can be successful for you as well as our students. Um, here's an example of uh, the number of uh, industry-led projects that we've had over the years. One of the really great things is that companies come back year over year. And so um, I'll get into that a little bit. And as I mentioned, our industry partners um, have been with us several years, so they can talk about that. But one of the nice things is if you um, create this partnership and are able to come year over year, you can kind of have projects um, that continue or, or sprout different tracks and having a team um, come back um, year over year with each of our new cohorts. Um, so it's really great. Also, the students um, really find it valuable to work with outside organizations. So um, when I talk about the process of matching students with projects, um, the, the students are always really excited to, to rank these projects high and get that real world experience. And then um, one of the values of the company is um, creating a pipeline of potential talent and recruitment of these students into your organization. While also um, being able to explore some of side projects or innovative projects or an area of your business that maybe you don't, um, that doesn't have an immediate business need, but um, you're looking to explore. This is also a, a great way to do that. So um, this part of uh, the webinar, I'll talk about really this first part of the timeline. So um, I, I've been sending out some information. So some of you may have received that. We'll, we'll continue to share links um, to our attendees and then also on our website. But this is really the time where you wanna start thinking about possible project ideas um, because we want you to submit um, those potential project titles in March. The good thing is it's just a title. So it's pretty low lift in your organization, um, but it, it gets um, us to know kind of what kind of projects may be showing up. Um, and it also helps you all start to frame out what that might look like. And so what we do with those project titles, we'll get a database of them and we'll share with our incoming students around April. So that's really exciting for the students to see what potential projects would uh, be available if they jo join Berkeley and accept um, for next year. And it also um, helps us understand how many projects we have. So if we need to recruit more. Um, and so the next thing of that, though, is after you have that project title, you have a couple months um, to really internally or at your organization or depending um, which business unit craft what that proposal could be. Um, and the titles can change slightly. It's not locking you into anything, um, but it helps us understand, um, you know, how many we have and then you also to kind of start crafting what potential projects could be. And so um, we'll ask for those final ones um, definitely by June, but starting to work on those in May. And since we have a couple of months, um, I am available to meet with you or colleagues at your company that are interested in this to really help craft um, what a proposal that is in line um, with what the technical needs of our program and the degree requirements, and then also what might work for you as an organization, especially if you're new to this. We have some um, tips that I'll sh that we'll share today and that I can also help with 
of like what really interests students, how to frame it over this nine months. Um, so that's also an opportunity for you. Uh, the next bullet points I'll just touch on briefly um, today. So one of the key points after you do that, um, and you have off for the summer, then back in August, we get started again. Um, and we have an info fair. So how this matching process works is um, the students are ranking the projects um, and then the companies um, as well as the faculty see those rankings and then are able to recruit students to work on their projects. So it's pretty similar to um, a job interview in that way. And so um, the, obviously the more students that you can get interested in your project, the more you have to select from. And um, one way we do that is we have this capstone info fair. So it's a, a web-based platform that we have in August um, where you're able to pitch the project um, and also meet with different students that are interested and ask questions. So it's a really great time for you get to know the students and also share more about the project to gain interest in it. And then immediately following that, so there's a quick turnaround, we have the project matching um, where the students will rank and then our project partners will send offers to the students. And then the rest of uh, the time is really spent digging in and working on um, the project and, make, and making progress until degree completion, which happens in May. And um, we'll get into a little bit of what that looks like. And I, I know our partners will share some of their experience in that realm as well. Okay, so my predecessor, um, had put these slides together and I, I kept a lot of them because he does a really great job of looking at the details and the language around how we're doing this. So I really liked how he structured that, but I cannot take credit for it. So, um, you know, obviously you want to start thinking about what project this could be um, and internally at your organization. And, and as I mentioned, we want it to be successful for you as well as our students. So I'm going to share a little bit of slides and some tips about how you can do that. Um, so at the core of the successful capstone is a problem that you'd like to address. And so first focusing on problem, um, and two things here to make it really beneficial for, for you and the students. One is having an industry advisor. So someone in your organization who has the expertise and experience, um, and time and bandwidth to be able to work with these students. Um, so while a lot of our students have technical um, abilities and skills and they're gaining more while they're having their degree program, having someone in your organization to be able to help facilitate um, issues that they may have um, is really valuable. And also being able to devote that time. Um, I think like with anything, the more um, time you're able to invest, the more you get out of it. So this is kind of no different in that way. Um, but and, and we want to help you structure it where, you know, it isn't um, the, the onus on you or the bandwidth, like it's reasonable. This is something that's valuable to your organization. So thinking about that as well. The other thing is really thinking about the project from this exploratory view or lens. So it's not an internship. So if you have kind of um, an immediate business need, um, this would not be the place to pitch that. I think that, you know, in the students, um, you know, working on task or, um, or, you know, daily um, deliverables is not really the structure for this. Again, that's, that's much more geared towards internships, which we can also help you fill. Uh, but that's a different thing than the capstone. So we want to think about that. And the problem, it's, it's almost like you, you don't want it so narrow um, and so open. So there's, there's a balance within that, right? It needs to be narrow enough that there's a project scope. Um, there's somewhat of a, a loose timeline and deliverables for the students to achieve um, while also not being um, too narrow that specific that they have some areas to explore. I mean, it's really great. We have, these are graduate students, um, you know, who applied to this, you know, engineering leadership program. So they have a lot of great skills and interests where they're able to pursue in this space. And so having it somewhat open and exploratory um, also really helps set it up for success. Um, the next student or the next word is, is really the like word. So again, 
because there is some commitment from your organization and, and your employees, um, really wanting to make sure it justifies the advising commitment required from you. So making sure it's valuable within your organization. Um, and again, it's not necessarily something that is that immediate business need or a critical path to something else that you're doing, but um, something that you're interested in and maybe has a longer time horizon or another area that you're just interested in exploring that you haven't been able to yet um, for whatever reason. That, that's really a great kind of like framing for the, for the type of project. Um, the next thing is is what what you would like to address. So I think thinking about um, you know how to structure this so that the students can make um, progress within nine months. So it is pretty short in that way. Also recognizing our students are taking courses um, and you know the speed of academics maybe moves a little different than the speed of business. Um, and so really thinking about that when when you think about how to structure this. Um, and so you also want to find it valuable and there's accomplishments, but then our MN students as well. So um, when projects are really great, the students can dig in and make progress. And so having some kind of trajectory that they're going on, again, it, it can still be that exploratory, but there, there's like some deliverables that they're they're moving towards, even if it has to pivot. We also let our students know that, right? That's the real world. Projects um, have to pivot, or you know, you wanted to try something that didn't work out, and and that was some of the work that the students were doing, and that's totally okay. But that there's still kind of progress made throughout, um, and and that's kind of those this last bullet point here about just there's. Um, some balance of them learning by doing as they're moving through this, but then also they're making um, steps towards goals and deliverables throughout. And again, um, it'll be great because some of our um, industry partners who are here can can chat about that. Um, the other thing around this too is it's often good, as I mentioned, the business academic different timelines. Um, if there's not rigid deadlines, um, so um, because they have classes, they have um, you know, different things that are, they're going on um, in their um, school and, and degree pursuit that they have to also balance around there. So the deliverables and requirements are perfectly um, acceptable and, you know, requested to make it a good project, but they're just not something that's so rigid um, that they have some flexibility to balance with their other commitments as well. Um, so the next thing I'll talk a little bit about is um, kind of what expectations beyond, um, you know, what I spoke about earlier um, that you can provide and, and what the students are expected to do. And again, it's a short overview, but just gives you a little insight into um, what this looks like. So uh, on the advisor side, um, at least advising one hour to week on average that really sets, again, the more you're able to invest, that's kind of up to you as an organization. But um, at a minimum, that really sets it up for a successful project that the students are able to check in. Uh, there's a place for them to ask questions or if they run into problems. It also allows you to help make sure they're on track um, and, and, and kind of pursuing the goals that you, that you have set up in the original project. Um, the next two bullet points are inputs and tools. So how we want to think about this, one of the valuable um, value propositions for the students to work with industry is they really like access to data sets or different type of technology that you're working on. And so being able to provide those and what is required for the project really makes it successful. Um, and especially if you think about having it at the launch of the um, project as well, right? So they can kind of hit the ground running when they get matched and started. Um, so thinking about having those aligned um, when you set the project up. The other thing is any tools. So we don't have um, lab access here at UC Berkeley for our industrial partners. We do have space. So we're actually creating a, a new maker space where our students are able to um, store some of the equipment wor they're working on, or their robots that they're um, developing or um, as they're prototyping different solutions. So we have some area and space for them to um, have that and keep it locked and secure. 
Um, but beyond that, there's no like lab or bench top um, uh, space for them to um, access certain uh, materials or requirements or tools that might be needed for your project. Um, and it, it doesn't work in that way anyway, because um, you want to be able to keep your IP as the students are working on it, which I'll touch on. Um, and that requires you not to use university um, space in that way. Um, any additional expenses too. So I think if there's meetings or field research, making sure that you're able to provide those resources um, to the students um, as they're working on the project. And then on the student side, so um, one of the things to set them up for success is, and you'll see when you fill out the um, complete project proposals, what skills are you looking for? Um, and it's really good balance to think about what skills you need and then what skills the students will gain from the project as well. Um, and so that kind of helps them identify, okay, I, this matches my skill set and kind of what I want to learn. It also helps ensure that you get students that are able to make progress on your project. Um, they commit six to nine hours of work per week um, on the project. So that's what you can expect. Also with our um, industry partners, they um, are able to sign NDAs and also waive their IP rights because they aren't using, um, as I mentioned, university property or, or lab space or anything like that um, for this. So um, here is a website and we can also drop this link in the chat. Um, if you'd like more information, again, I'm always available to work on um, helping you craft a proposal or just chat about this project experience. Um, and, and I'll have this at the end of the deck too, but I'll go ahead and jump over to introducing our two project partners. Um, Doug from Squishy Robotics will go first, um, and then I'll toss it over to Tiffany. Uh, well, good afternoon. My name is Douglas Hutchings. I'm with a company called Squishy uh, Robotics. Um, just a little background about ourselves. We work in uh, with fire departments and defense customers and sort of people in that sort of realm, industrial partners, and we're about a 10-person company. Um, we grew out of a UC Berkeley research lab and have a pretty extensive and longstanding, um, you know, cooperate, not cooperation, like ties to the university. And we typically take about, about six to eight students, I uh, mentioned students a year, and have been doing this for, I think, five years at this point, more back when we were uh, formally with the university. Um, just some sort of, you know, advice, if I may offer it, about things I've learned over the years. Probably one of the biggest and most important thing is taking time to understand the students during the interview process is really key. Oftentimes, you know, it's a diverse student group, both international and uh, U.S. students, and there are some students out there who are interested in a whole, developing a whole new skill set from what their resume says they've had in the past. I mean, you know, that's oftentimes, you know, students who've gone back to grad school want to develop a new skill set. Other times, it's there are students who want to dive in on a very particular topic to the exclusion of others. And taking time to understand during the interview process that sort of diversity and what each student is interested in, which may not necessarily be the same thing as the classes they're taking, is really important and so probably the single biggest takeaway I have in terms of running a successful project. Um, we run our projects with sprint presentations, which means that twice a semester, we ask the MN students to prepare a presentation for the company about their project and what they're doing. Serves as a good motivator for getting things done. It also serves as a great time to have conversations about changing direction um, so that we can like have those designated conversations. Our company is close enough to UC Berkeley that they come to our offices to work, which means we have some pretty good interrelationship and pretty good contact with them. And it also enables them to work on our actual physical product. And so typically we are asking students to develop new features that have been informed by customer research that are not on our immediate time frame. And what happens is students take our product, build a first draft prototype, and then after the school year, we take it and run it through to completion. Um, one other salient point, MN students can serve as a, tiring, a talent pool for future hiring, both internships and full-time students. We have point blank hired MN students uh, a few months after they graduate from our, from our MN program. It's a great one-year interview process if you want to look at it like that. Um, MN students are pretty important to how um, to, to squish robotics, and we are very happy to support them every year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, Jennifer put up a, a timeline of the MN program. I just wanted to like, from a 
from an advisor's perspective, how the school year develops. Um, during the summer, you're thinking a lot about project scope, about what projects do I want to propose and what um, are we coming to campus? Are we, are we coming to the office? Are they working remote? And who's supporting them? It's important to get those pieces in place beforehand because the matching process that Jennifer mentioned, it is, it's a week or two and it's going to be a pretty intensive week or two, especially depending upon how many student applicants you get. It's really important to be able to have conversations with the students. And so making sure you've got time blocked off for that and being able to talk to everybody, we found that really helps long-term outcomes of the projects. After that, though, there's product onboarding. And depending upon how exploratory you want the project to be versus how tightly coupled you want it to be to your product, that might mean putting in some onboarding time on your side. And we found that that onboarding time it uh, is worth it in the long run. Um, generally, the most productive times for MN students after they get onboarded is early second semester. That's January to May, April, sorry, generally to March or April. It's when they're really hitting the road and, and making great progress. The last two steps, it's important to do project handoff. Depending upon where MN students go, sometimes you're going for different jobs and they've already got a job lined up. And you need to keep in mind that MN students have a one-year program and a one-year commitment. So it's really important to offboard the project to your full-time engineering team so that you can make use of it. On the other hand, and this is why, you know, having conversations with your students is really helpful. There are students who maybe haven't found a job yet and summer internships can happen. There may be sometimes um, international students who are like looking for a particular company who like offers a long-term visa, but they need somewhere to work on the short term. That's an opportunity for companies, and we've done that a few times, uh, more than a few actually, and then hiring full-time employees from the image tool program also happens, and so it's helpful to sort of think about in January, February, and March, and have those conversations with your students to understand what that might be. Point blank, we get a lot out of what happens after the end of the school year, even though the image program as a program ends when everybody graduates. We're really excited to be part of this image program every year and we look forward to uh, doing so in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, really great perspective. And I loved how you matched the timeline with kind of what we were showing. So um, I'll toss it over to Tiffany now, um, who's at Blue Goju, who can talk a little bit to her experience. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tiffany. I'm the lead product design engineer here at Blue Goji. And we also have a long relationship with um, the capstones, I actually was a capstone student in 2019, and now I work for Blue Goji and I'm running help advising the capstones for the past three years. So uh, I'm really happy that I'm able to give back and right, I fully support and I think this is a great opportunity for both industry sponsors and for the students. Um, so a little bit about Blue Goji is we're actually actually based in Austin, Texas. So that provides its own set of challenges being not in California, close to the university, which I'll get into. And um, we are a health tech company. So we look at how we can adapt cardio equipment and machines to provide a more quantitative analysis of people's biomechanics and their physical data. So uh, some advice that I found really helpful when organizing the capstones for the students is we typically do meetings every two weeks with the students. And these are very uh, sort of targeted. We have an agenda that we have questions for the students on how they're doing, how the progress is. Um, we also do Slack communication to just have ease, you know, beyond email. So the students feel there's a lot of sense of transparency between uh, the team since we are very remote from California. Um, in terms of also communication, we, the team at Blue Goji, we are, some of our engineers fly out in the beginning of the semester to help build camaraderie and learn about the students, learn about their interests. And we always catch up with them at the end, also in May for their capstone fair and, you know, to get together and generate excitement, you know, for both of us. Um, Another thing is that a lot of Blue Goji projects are very hardware oriented. Like I mentioned, we do a lot of exercise equipment. So for us, budgeting is extremely important, especially for the scope of, you know, the type of project you want. So uh, that's always the biggest question that comes from the students from my experience on, you know, how much money are they allowed to spend? And the way we've done it is 
we generate these quarterly milestones. Um, for example, like Douglas mentioned, um, I totally agree that it ramps up way more in the second semester. So we try to create a budget based on the milestones, you know, what is the goal of the first semester? It could be just, usually we do initial ideation, you know, they're making mock prototypes of three or five ideas that they're exploring. And then once the first semester ends, they have chosen an idea and then can really build the full scale model in the second semester. And another thing we do in terms of organization is um, creating sub teams. We found that, you know, once we talk to the students and organize them based on their interests, we like the students to talk amongst themselves and manage, um, you know, how should they divide the project. We, of course, advise them on, you know, suggestions on industrial design team or electronics or a motors team. So we'll provide that advice on how we imagine the technical sub team should be, but um, we really believe the students should be more involved in the planning and really see so they can see the scope of what goes into a project, not just technical details, but the management aspect operational wise. And like I mentioned, we create quarterly milestones for the students to achieve in the first and second semester. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. <clears throat> Since we found having one big major idea is can be overwhelming for the students. So we help a system where, you know, we think that the first milestone should be, you know, just ideating three to five ideas and then a small prototyping phase of those three to five ideas before selecting the final idea. And um, Jennifer mentioned this earlier, but a suggestion on project proposal scope. Usually for Blue Goji, we choose a very exploratory topic or idea, for example, virtual reality and exercise machines. So it's something that's not part of our immediate business roadmap, you know, for commercial sales or anything, but it's something that we think is an interesting topic that could be, you know, integrated in our machines eventually. So um, that's a little bit about Blue Goji. And I'll hand it back to Jennifer. Thank you so much, Tiffany. So great to hear from both of them and the different perspectives and a little bit about what works well. Um, I'm gonna uh, pass it over to Julie before we get into the Q&A portion, uh, who can talk about other ways that um, companies can get involved with the Fung Institute. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, I think Tiffany and Doug said it best, uh, but I, I appreciate the a moment to introduce myself. I'm Julie McShane, the Director of Career Development and Alumni Relations here at the Fung Institute. And we like to work very closely with capstone partners. So once organizations um, sponsor a capstone, um, I like to meet with them and see what their recruiting needs. And there, there's a lot of opportunities to, to participate with students outside of the capstone as well. Um, similar to what, what Doug mentioned, um, this could fill, fulfill a pipeline for companies, whether it's internships or full-time hire. Um, there are opportunities to engage with students in our programming, anything from exclusive invitations to networking events and industry panels. We have mentorship programs, and a lot of companies like to get involved with, with that programming as well. Um, we also have a complimentary service to post jobs, and we like to connect with our capstone partners to make sure we're highlighting their open roles um, at any point during the year, um, but especially as students are, are getting ready to graduate. Um, and I'm open to meet with capstone providers at any point during the year to develop a, a recruiting strategy. I'll drop some of these links into the chat um, to make sure you, you have them and you can even start working with us now. I'm happy to talk to anybody that, that wants to recruit from UC Berkeley Masters of Engineering program or our alumni community. Um, the, the next slide, um, this has been highlighted a little bit, but just to reiterate that this is a one-year professional program. So students are looking for full-time employment when they graduate. So for this situation, they'd be graduating in May 2024 and looking to, to start full-time employment after they graduate. And they go into a variety of different roles. So our students are 
um, skilled in, with everything from hardware to software and data science. Many of them are looking to go into program or project management. So it's really a, a wide variety of talent that, that you'd be exposed to. Um, so I just wanted to, again, introduce myself and let you know a little bit about um, joining the, the Capstone program and the Fung Institute and what other ways there are to get involved. So thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, Julie. Um, so with that, that ends kind of our formal, I'm going to, um, our formal webinar. I'll go ahead and leave um, some of these links up here. Um, I'm always happy to chat with you um, about potential proposals, or if you have an idea you want to help craft or see if it might be online, feel free to send me an email. Um, and then I, we can open it up now for Q&A. If, if there's anything in the chat or if you have questions, um, feel free to put them in there and then uh, Kelly can help us with that. Yeah, we have um, a couple of questions that have come through in the chat. So let me... Uh... Give you the first one here, Jennifer. Interns in California have to be paid if they are producing valuable IP. The capstone students will produce meaningful IP. Does a company pay the capstone students? If not, how does the intern law impact that? That is a great complicated question. Um, mm -hmm. And I will, I will do my best to, to answer that. Um, and anyone else can jump in and we can also get that information. Um, so the, since the capstone is not an internship program, so they will not be necessarily hired onto your organization going through HR, it is part of a degree in a coursework program. Um, so it doesn't fall in line underneath those internship requirements. It's a very similar thing. Um, I think across universities, across campus, um, where students are working on, um, uh, projects with external partners. Um, so it's a part of the coursework, so it doesn't fall under um, those requirements. Great. Next question. Can you talk more about where physically students do their work? Yeah, that's a great question and, and add in a little bit more um, context if you have it. But so um, we are housed at C Berkeley. So we have the Fung Institute. Um, we were growing class, as you saw, so we have two buildings on campus, Shires Hall and also Mud Hall, um, that has open workspace um, for the students to work on or do Zoom meetings or study, and um, so that's primarily where the students are working, um, and obviously they're doing a lot of Zoom meetings and those kinds of things as well, um, but the physical locations is on campus. If I may, it's, it's sure. depending upon the company in question, like as a particular example, uh, Squish Robotics is about a 20 minute bus ride away. And in, in that particular case, I know it's not the case for many companies, but for those companies that are close by, students will tend to come to the office. And that's very situational. I, I can speak as well. So uh, Blue Goji is fortunate enough for our faculty liaison, we have a lab space. So uh, that's we have, you know, only our students have access to, so they're able to store prototypes and things like that. But hardware and tool wise, yes, Blue Goji provides all the tools because of all the, you know, IP that Jennifer mentioned, we pay for their 3D printers, you know, filaments, materials, anything bigger, we outsource from like Zometry or third-party prototyping shops for them to receive that. And then they just build it together amongst themselves and either like Mud Hall, like um, Jennifer mentioned and other spaces on campus. So. Great, thanks. I, um, another question, how many students can participate in a project? And I would add here too, Jennifer, maybe we could talk about the idea, team size and variance to that. Yeah. Um, so because um, teaming and learning to work in an interdisciplinary team and, and across disciplines and project management and timelines and part of their um, professional um, development while they're here, um, we do want it to be a team project. Um, so the ideal team is anywhere from three to five students. Um, so we do our best to try to limit um, our team size to that. Um, as Tiffany and, and Doug actually probably both experienced, um, if you do get lots of students on one project, depending on your bandwidth, if you're able to support that many, you can have sub teams. So if you know you get 
10 students that are interested, you could have two teams of five um, or whatnot um, based on kind of the needs of the project. Um, but we do want them to get that teaming experience and project management and, and working together because um, to set them up for success as they enter the workforce. Sounds good. Have another question. I have a couple more actually. Is there a list of the tools they have access to and does the workspace include syncs? So maybe some nitty gritty information about we, we what's do, literally on hand. Yeah, we do have syncs. Um, we I, I we do have a list of tools on our website as far as like software that's just kind of open source so that UC Berkeley provides. Um, and um, there's some like just general hardware software tools so soldering irons those types of things but not extensive and as T tiffany mentioned a lot of the organizations provide resources and those types of things that are needed um so that you're not using um equipment on campus that way it would kind of violate the ip um but we do want to provide like kind of the basic tools and their sinks and these types of things and storage for the teams Great. Next up, what technical skill sets are generally seen across board for mechanical engineering capstone projects? I would like to brush up on any of those prior to August as I have some free time. I'd love everyone's input. Thanks. Can you read that one more time? I guess I'm not understanding question. Sure. Um, what technical skill sets are generally seen across the board for mechanical engineering capstone projects? So I guess ME focused mm -hmm. um, problems. I would like to brush up on any of those prior to August as I have some free time, maybe some example of some ME focused projects. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a mechanical engineering. I did my degree here at UC Berkeley. So well-versed in, in those skills. Um, also well versed that they range a lot. So mechanical engineering is a pretty broad discipline. Um, so in the mechanical engineers, I mean, they have worked on projects related to robotics or controls. Um, we also have mechanical engineers that are working on more product design and the design and prototyping oriented projects. Um, also had focused on, we do have some in mechanical engineers who um, have good experience in programming, not all, um, but that's usually an interest or a focus that they had in their undergraduate. It's obviously not as common as you would see, or that level of skill set versus if you were looking at it, EECS or electrical engineering or computer science major. Um, a lot of our uh, mechanical engineers uh, projects also focused on data sets. So looking at um, big data, um, machine learning as well. But again, it, it really varies just because the students have some diversification in what they focused on in undergrad. Um, and then the other thing would be hardware uh, prototyping um, is another skill set in some of the projects that have um, focused for the mechanical engineering folks. Looks like the question has been um, focused on robotics in particular in the chat. I don't know if you can speak to that specifically. I think it sounds like it's gonna vary and maybe it's part of the process of developing your project, Jennifer, and the, like as you're honing in on that and then the skills you're looking for. Yeah, I think it does really vary across it. And Doug might be able to check it, but I think even within robotics, you're doing different things. So there's controls within robotics. There's also um, the actual physical prototyping and building and designing of, of the product. Um, there's a lot like electronics that are associated within it. Um, so it is pretty varied across the board. But yeah, Doug, if you if you jump in specifically on maybe some squishy robotic projects. Yeah, I, I guess I'd be happy to have it. If you wanted to like give out my give out my email, I'd be happy to address this question directly. But sort of in brief, skill sets really do vary. Sorry, that's the way it works. This many students. Um, there's sort of like a, a maybe two to three buckets of people. Bucket number one are students who are in the controls program. These are people who have some prior experience with robotics. Sometimes it's not a lot. Sometimes it's extremely substantial. And they're taking higher level control classes focused on machine, on like model predictive control, machine learning, things like that. Then there's sort of bucket number two, which is the product design students who are interested in robots. Those are the people who go out and build robot looking hardware. And then sort of group of then bucket number three comes sort of as I understand it, some of the EEC students have a software robotics background. 
Um, I cannot speak to that as directly, but I believe it, that such a thing exists. I'd be happy to take a, a more specific question offline um, because it really varies based upon the student's background. Uh, but those are sort of like three general buckets I've come to expect. Thank you for that, Doug. And also a quick point, and I'm happy to share more. We have some example projects that are on our website. So you can kind of see that as well um, for, for what has been out there. Other questions, Kelly? Yeah, and maybe this is you know an opportunity. Thanks, Doug, for offering to take this offline and do one-on-ones with Doug or Jennifer to get more deep into specifics as well. Um, so I had a quick question on yeah. cohort size. Um, I know last year, I think the cohort size was bigger than, uh, sorry, smaller than expected. So it was more difficult to build a team than the previous years. Where, what do we stand for this for this year? Yeah, that's a great question. So we're right now in um, our admission cycle for all the departments, but it looks like that we will see around um, more closer to the 500 um, uh, number of students. It, it'll always change. Um, and however, what we'll do then is um, manage um, the capstone partners and again, help um, highlight some of the industry partnerships and opportunities for the students. Um, because the students really want to be able to work on those types of projects. So help work with you all closely for that. Um, so we can ensure some of the matching as well. Sounds great. Thank you. So you said 500 this year. Is it more than last year? It is. It is more. Okay. Great. Um, Jennifer, going to return to IP a little bit, still a little confusion. Are you saying that UC Berkeley will not make an IP claim to work done in the designated workspace and only with certain tools, but UC Berkeley may have a claim to work done anywhere else on campus or done in the designated workspace, but with other tools? Yeah, so there is a little bit, I, I try to clarify and again, can take this offline for more details. So really how, what the, um, the legal rule looks like is if it's any open space on campus, there's no IP. So if students are studying in the library, if they're working outside, if they're doing these things that are open, if, you, if you're using more of like um, wet lab space in, in a facility or something that like not every student has access to, then that's where you start to um, have to like consider um, IP issues because you're using um, capital equipment and things that were purchased through the university, but any of the open spaces and the general area. So none of our buildings have that um, are, are fine. So that's kind of the, the tipping point of if you're using like those types of capital equipment resources that are on campus. Um, that's kind of that distinction, but happy to again talk more offline if they're specific. Okay, so last up, I think that um, we've already um, touched on the fact that we will be sharing the slides. Is that right, Jennifer, with all these yes. good links in? Yeah. I'll follow up with everyone who registered with um, the slide deck, as well as any of the links that are included. And that's about it in the Q&A. Okay. Well, I know we are a little over time, so really want to thank our guests. Thank you, Doug and Tiffany, for joining us. Um, our Fung Institute staff, Kelly, Ashley, and Julie. Um, again, please reach out to me. Here's my email. Um, really excited to have y'all on board and kind of build our industry network. Have a wonderful rest of your Thursday.